introduce Dan Dorman. Dan is a Deputy Executive Director for Operations at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the lead for this initiative. Dan. Thank you, Lance. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'd like to add my welcome to this 30th Regulatory Information Conference. I'm going to briefly go through an overview of what the task is, is that's been given to the transformation team and where we are in that process uh, and key up some of the, the themes that we're pondering based on the feedback that we've gotten so far. And then I'm going to invite you to uh, share with us your views on are we looking at the right themes or is there something else we should be looking at? Uh, what, are, what are the impacts or the benefits uh, if we pursue transformation in these areas and, and maybe what obstacles you might see that, that we need to anticipate and be prepared to overcome. So on January 25th of this year, uh, our EDO, Vic McCree, chartered a group of NRC staff to explore possibilities for transformative change in our organization, organizational culture and regulatory framework uh, that may enable the safe use of new or novel technology in nuclear applications. In this session, we'll give you the overview of the efforts to date, and in particular, the themes that are developing from our information gathering. But more importantly for this session, the team is looking to hear from you, your impression of these themes. Are they the right areas? Are there other areas that you think would be more important for us to consider? What would be the impacts of transformational change in these areas? What obstacles do you see to achieving transformation in these areas? We want to do this to enhance the NRC's safety mission effectiveness, but what mission risks should we watch out for? So in a few minutes, I'll give you the floor, but first, why transformation? We all know that technology is changing faster than we can keep up. Think about a decade ago when smartphones didn't exist, or merely 25 years ago when very few of us even had cell phones. The pace of technological change is accelerating, uh, as the, the quote that you see there, Vic McCree used in his speech this morning also, the, chair, the uh, chief executive officer of General Motors saying that we're in the midst of seeing more change in the next five years than we've seen in the previous 50. So think about the amount of technology change then that could occur over the next 50 years. In terms of changes in the automobile industry, barely a century ago we got rid of the horse, now we're getting rid of the driver. There have been and will be similar advances in technology applicable to nuclear applications. And while the NRC does not promote or facilitate development of new technologies, when and if they arrive, we must have a regulatory structure that is able to effectively, efficiently, and agilely regulate them as appropriate, consistent with our safety and security mission and our principles of good regulation. Specifically, the principle of efficiency, which states that the American taxpayer is entitled to the best possible management and administration of regulatory activities, but also the principles of clarity and reliability are essential to applicants and licensees who want confidence in a clear and consistent regulatory approach. We cannot be an efficient and effective regulator unless we are continuously upgrading our regulatory capabilities to address the changing technologies. NRC's regulations have effectively protected people in the environment and in that regard have served the country well. They have and will continue to assure safety and security. In some cases, NRC regulations, however, were written to be technology specific and do not easily accommodate new technologies such as advanced reactors and not so new technologies as we heard this morning such as digital instrumentation and control. It is our responsibility to ensure that our regulations continue to provide the same level of safety in a manner that accommodates the new technologies. What's more, we want to ensure that our regulatory framework does not present a barrier to safety enhancements. This is an important step to continue to be a relevant and modern regulator in the future. NRC is fully invested in this effort to transform our regulatory structure where needed to accommodate the safe use of new technologies and I'm confident that we will be successful. We have the technical expertise needed to fulfill our safety mission. We have a highly motivated and competent staff. Our vision is that this agency enable rather than be a barrier to new technologies that continue to meet our safety standards so that we can continue to be a modern, effective regulator. This statement 
that the nuclear industry has indicated plans to introduce new and novel technologies, and because, of the, because the use of such new nuclear technologies would challenge our current regulatory framework, we must not only innovate but also identify and implement transformative change, is a quote from our tasking memo from Vic McCree. And it summarizes the why we transform that I've just discussed. So let me talk a little bit about what we mean by transformation. We at the NRC are defining transformation as a fundamental change or fulfilling our mission in a different way under a different paradigm. Uh, we've talked within the team about uh, approaching an area of our regulations uh, with a clean sheet of paper. Examples uh, of transformation are the change in the business model brought about by Amazon in the area of electronic commerce. Uh, as Vic mentioned this morning, for us at the NRC, the development of Part 52 for licensing new reactors and the changes to the reactor oversight process about 20 years ago are examples where we have had transformational change. We anticipate that the areas where we transform our regulatory framework more, will more fully align us with our principles of good regulations and will enhance our effectiveness, efficiency, and agility. As important as what transformation is, is what it's not. This has no intent to change our mission in any way. We will continue to fulfill our mission to protect public health and safety and the environment. It's distinct in our parlance from innovation. Innovation is an incremental change or a better way of doing what we currently do. Examples of innovation would be earbuds instead of headphones. Or for the NRC, Project AIM uh, or streamlining the concurrence process would be examples of innovation or incremental change. Innovation and transformation both benefit the agency and both are needed. One does not supplant the other. NRC has established innovation forums throughout the agency to promote a continuous improvement culture. Innovation for us means incremental changes that improve our way of doing business and innovation is essential to the health of the agency and our mission effectiveness. But from time to time, a more fundamental change is needed. And finally, this transformation initiative is not a short-lived effort that will pass with time. Although our project task time is only 90 days, the, the effort is intended to engender a sustained shift in the agency's mindset to be more open to better ways to fulfill our mission. We are committed to making the transformative changes needed to enable new technologies consistent with our mission and our principles. As mentioned earlier, uh, Vic McCree issued the memo to form the team at the end of January. The team members represent multiple offices across the agency as well as a wide diversity of our staff with different skills and experiences. The tasking memo emphasized the need for a paradigm shift in our regulatory structure and processes to address the development of new nuclear technologies. The transformation team was tasked with identifying potential transformative changes to the NRC's regulatory framework, culture, and infrastructure to further enhance our effectiveness, efficiency, and agility. The four bullets on this slide are the specific taskings in our memo. In addition to these specific areas to consider for transformative change, the team will identify strategies to enhance and sustain the transformative culture throughout the agency. As I mentioned, we have a 90-day task time, and given this short timeline, the intent of our effort is not to implement transformational initiatives, but to recommend ideas for transformative changes. We have been out gathering insights and ideas, and after this week, we will begin to shape those ideas into actionable recommendations which we expect to provide to the Commission in May. The tasking memo, uh, as well as a previous uh, memo from the Executive Director to the NRC staff on January 4th, which you can find those two memos together in Adams, uh, identified the primary focus of the team's efforts as changes to our regulatory framework to accommodate new technologies. Specific areas of consideration included in our tasking memo are listed on this slide. The team has engaged internal and external stakeholders in these areas directly to solicit input on the development of transformative ideas. 
We have also conducted outreach more broadly to solicit input on transformative ideas that support the development of safe new technologies in other areas. And in addition, we are considering strategies to enhance and sustain a transformative organizational culture. The transformation team has conducted many outreach efforts both internally and externally. We have received over 500 ideas from within the NRC and have explored best practices with diverse external stakeholders, including other federal agencies, non-governmental organizations, and private sector entities. Here we get to the hub of the matter. This, this slide shows some of the main themes that we have heard in our outreach to date. I want to emphasize that these are themes that we've developed from ideas that we've received and they need further development before they become actionable recommended initiatives. So in a few minutes when I wrap up, I will invite your thoughts on these themes or any other ideas for transformation at the NRC. The most prominent theme we've heard is the need for consistent and expanded use of qualitative and quantitative risk insights in licensing decisions. As most of you are aware, the NRC has applied risk insights to its decisions for many years. There are several existing commission policy statements that encourage the use of risk insights. However, a structured approach to the licensing decision-making process has not been established and consistently applied. And there is little guidance for the staff on how to apply these concepts to the scope of a regulatory review and to regulatory decisions. Qualitative risk considerations are not uniformly used to inform the scope of our reviews. And the feedback the team has received to date suggests that it may be warranted to expand the use of risk-informed decision-making, including the use of existing prior approvals or reviews to focus the scope of our reviews going forward. We have also heard an interest in accepting more uncertainty for inherently safer technologies. The suggestion is that these concepts would help the NRC staff to provide its regulatory conclusions with clearer context of overall risk. A second theme is the potential for more flexibility for licensees to make more non-risk significant changes to their licensing bases without prior NRC approval. A third theme is the need for timely resolution to challenges associated with new or novel technologies, especially digital instrumentation and controls, accident-tolerant fuels, and advanced reactors. And with respect to specific technical areas, some broad themes include the need for higher level, more performance-based, and less prescriptive regulations, and support for incremental or early involvement in design reviews. At the bottom of the slide, you see some of the things that we're pondering with relation to the organizational culture, both in terms of the ongoing culture of the agency, but also issues that may need to be considered uh, to ensure the success of any initiatives that we recommend to the Commission. So as I mentioned previously, uh, during this session, we would like to receive your feedback on these themes by addressing these questions in particular. What are the most important areas for us to tackle? Is it the things that were on that previous slide, or is there something else that you think we need to be focused on? How should we transform in these areas or another area that you have an interest? What obstacles should we anticipate for the process of implementing the transformation? And how would this transformation be beneficial? So as uh, Lance noted, there are several ways that you can provide us ideas. We have about an hour and 15 minutes here to hear from you. We will have uh, handheld mics in the aisle. You can come up to a microphone. Uh, and again, we can't get everybody here in, a, in an hour and 15 minutes, so we'd ask you to be concise on your points. But you can also fill out one of the cards on your seat, and, and obviously there's, there's uh, limited space on those, but we'll be collecting those cards, and those cards will be considered by the team as we refine these themes. Uh, and then finally, if you want to submit a more substantive uh, input to us, this email address, transformation.resource at nrc.gov, uh, is available for you to send us any thoughts that you want to share with the transformation team. If we get your in email by the end of Thursday, uh, I can assure you that we will consider it as we are developing our recommendations. Anything we get after Thursday, uh, we do have a very limited time to, to bring this to, to uh, a set of actionable ideas, 
Uh, so anything beyond that time we will consider to the extent that we can. So this concludes my overview. Uh, the, the team are sprinkled here among the audience. Uh, I, I want to also introduce Ms. Andrea Cook as the deputy team leader for this effort. Uh, and we, we, the team, are very much looking forward to your thoughts. And so now I'll turn it back to Lance to guide us through the conversation. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, so as Dan and I were talking before the session and he, and he was looking at everyone coming in and saying, I hope they're not coming in expecting to hear me talk the entire time because we're, we're really here to listen to you. And that's, that's the, the main reason that we wanted to have this session uh, because we are seeking to get input uh, in terms of how the NRC should transform. Uh, Dan went over a couple of the ideas, but again, we're, we're looking to get some input. You know, are, are we on the right track? Do we have some ideas that uh, you have that we should consider? Um, so I've got uh, Richard Chang here in the front. We're gonna kind of do a, a zone defense, if you will. I've got Ruth Ann in the back. Um, so what we're hoping to do is that you'll approach one of them and uh, take a little bit of time at the mic ask a question, give a comment, give us some ideas. Um, we want to, to benefit from, from having you attend the session and to, to get the ideas and thoughts that you may have. So I guess the, the real question is, is who's brave enough to go first? Who's feeling bold today? Come on. I've got the, uh, the ideas up here on the screen. These are the ones that the, the team has kind of come up with at this point. Um, after, after this, we can move on to the questions as well, just to, to kind of circulate. But uh, again, and once, you, once you start with the microphone, if you could uh, introduce yourself and uh, any uh, group that you're with, please. Uh, thank you. Stephen Dolly with S&P Global Platts. I edit our newsletter, Inside NRC. I, I, I don't have a horse in this race, so I guess it's safe for me to start out. Uh, I'm not entirely seeing the difference between innovation and transformation. I look at this list, I've been doing this about 14, 15 years, and, and it seems like I've heard almost all of this before. Can you, can you tell us, you know, we have the risk-informed policy statement going back more than 20 years. Uh, we have Project AIM making, a, making the agency more efficient, agile, pick your adjective. Um, how is this, transformative initiative different than the numerous other transformative initiatives we've seen over the years? Thanks, thanks, Steve. Um, it's a great question and, and it's one of the things that the team is, is looking at on any of these themes is is, is it truly transformational? Um, I think probably the best example that we're chewing on that I would say is the most transformational would be in the area of digital instrumentation and controls. Uh, it was mentioned this morning that we've gone out and talked to another, a number of other agencies, uh, uh, Naval Reactors, FAA, FDA, uh, about how they license digital technologies in their applications. And they uh, just very broadly are, are setting requirements at a much higher level. Uh, than the level of detail involved in IEEE 603 1991, which is the endorsed standard in the Commission's regulations. So uh, as, as was mentioned this morning, there, there's been ongoing efforts. Uh, there was an effort late in the last decade to try and straighten out the licensing of digital INC, and, and you now we've got another effort trying to do that. And those efforts are incremental within the existing framework. Uh, I think what we're looking at as a potential area of, uh, of transformation would be a clean sheet of paper, uh, new set of standards starting at a higher level, uh, and looking at a different oversight paradigm to, uh, to achieve the approval of digital INC systems. So, th so I think that, that's a, a good example of a clean sheet of paper. Um, I think uh, some of the things we're chewing on in the risk-informed licensing realm uh, are certainly uh, they're, they're evolutionary in the sense that we've been on a journey for 40 years on risk-informed licensing. I think we're very good at doing extensive detailed reviews of applications that are predicated on detailed risk models. Uh, I think what we're exploring here 
uh, one of the things we're exploring here is how do we use risk insights at the front end of a licensing review to identify the risk significant components of the review and define the scope of the review differently than what we've done heretofore. So it, it's, a, it's a different paradigm in terms of how we would approach uh, a licensing review to support the conclusions of reasonable assurance of adequate protection. So, so I think uh, there are certainly areas within these themes that would be innovative within the definition that we're using. Uh, we're exploring what, what are the things that would be truly transformational. Sure. Real, real quick follow. Steve Nesbitt with Duke Energy. Um, hold, hold, Ruth, Ruth Ann, hold on. We have a, we have a follow up real quick. Sorry. Just real quickly, that uh, uh, Steve Dolly again. That that sounds very similar to what Commissioner Apostolakis's task force proposed several years ago. So there might be some lessons learned there. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Ruth Ann, please. Uh, Steve Nesbitt with Duke Energy. Actually, mine's is kind of a question. Uh, I saw that one of the areas you had listed was big data, and I'm having a problem understanding the nexus between big data and transformational change. So. Maybe you can explain a little further how that works. Sure. A uh, couple of things. First off, uh, big data uh, is, is in here because it was one of the areas that we were specifically tasked to look at uh, here on this slide, the last bullet there. Uh, and we're aware broadly of interest of utilities to use big data methods in their plants uh, to uh, have used system performance data to, to manage, for example, maintenance cycles. Um, it's not really clear that there's a regulatory nexus there. Uh, potentially, somewhere down the road, I could conceive of it getting into areas that maybe a, a big data is used to make just to justify uh, intervals that might impinge on maintenance rule thoughts or something like that. Um, we haven't really seen a lot. You, can see, you don't see big data popping up in our themes because we really haven't seen a lot for us in terms of our regulatory framework. Uh, we have had some discussion internal to the agency of uh, how we could use big data methods to uh, search our information systems, uh, for example, as part of uh, inspector sample selection. Uh, but it, it's that's not something that has popped, risen up to our themes here as something within our regulatory framework that we see an opportunity right now for a transformational initiative. Okay. Please, if you could, uh, yeah, if you want to hand over to her, Richard, thank you. Hi, Jennifer Pluskino with Empyrean Services. <clears throat> Just a suggestion, um, I'm new to the industry, but uh, power, uh, long-time power industry person, um, looking at it, almost stepping back and thinking about what your purpose is and bringing in the right, or not even the right, a diverse set of thoughts and people um, that might help you be more transformative versus innovative. So you might get people without nuclear engineering degrees or you know, people in different sectors that could help bring some really fresh mm -hmm. ideas to the table. Just a suggestion. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we have a, a question or comment in the back half in a minute. Wes Patrick, CNWRA. Um, a semantics aside, whether it's transformation, innovation, or whatever, uh, the biggest issue, I think, is that of change and change management. And frankly, in most organizations that I've been a part of over the years, management makes change sufficiently difficult that it is impossible to implement. And uh, I just, I guess, both encourage you to try to deal with that. I think it fits under your last bullet of culture, developing a, a culture of a willingness uh, to implement a change, no matter how small or large it may be. Yeah, thanks, Wes. I, I, I think that's critically important for two parts of our initiative. I think if, if we, uh, if I can find the, the tasking bullets, 
so the first the first one there is is related to overall the culture of the agency to support change in general uh, and and Vic talked this morning about his three pillars and and one of the pillars was t transformation and innovation one of them was the leadership vision and model and and that's an area where we're exploring ideas about being more open to new ideas and and less averse to uh, to enterprise risk in implementing new ideas as, as kind of uh, uh, um, catalysts, if you will, for, for a more change-oriented culture. And then the, the third bullet here is, is related to how we would implement a particular initiative and how we would enhance the likelihood of success of such an initiative and certainly uh, effective use of change management tools uh, is going to be key to any uh, of these change initiatives but I think I think the key to to the notion that this is not a short-lived uh, activity for the NRC is is bringing about that broader perspective of an openness to change which is you know, frankly you know we, we it, we can easily relax into a mode where we take the reliability principle of good regulation means we're resistance to change and that's what a good regulator is. But as you heard from, uh, from some of the commissioners this morning, our regulations just because they were the right regulation at the time they were put into place as the technology evolves, as the performance of the industry evolves, uh, we need to be ready to, to uh, adapt to that and, and be open to change all the time. So thanks for that. I just want to put an uh, additional plug in for Wes's comment. So we have reached out uh, internally to the agency and extensively outside the agency to look for just what Wes is talking about. How can we um, embrace and sustain a culture that um, supports transformation? And so we've gone to some other companies where they've had success and got some ideas, but part of what we'd like to hear from you is if you have ideas along what Wes is talking about, about the follow-up to this, which is going to be especially crucial to our work, um, we would be very interested in hearing that. Let's get start with Richard and then go to Ruthann. Richard? Uh, good afternoon. This is uh, Mike Meyer from Southern Company. Uh, first, I want to say we applaud this effort of transformation. We think this is very important and, uh, and very needed. Um, also, um, I want to point out when you know, any organization changes like this, uh, it's obviously going to be difficult to change people's level of thinking, to really shift the culture that's been embedded for, for so long. Uh, many of these organizations bring out people from the outside just to challenge the level of thinking. Sometimes we can't see it ourselves. I know you're getting input from external stakeholders, which is good, but are you bringing somebody outside to work with the NRC on what changes you should make? So, um I think this is part of that, but I, I take your question, are we bringing in somebody under contract to help guide our process? And, and, and we have not done that with this team, um, but as Andrea indicated, we've been going out and talking not just to people who are in our business, but people outside our business. Um, you know, one, one, of the, uh, we, we, one of the organizations that the team went and talked to is an organization called DIUX, which is a part of uh, keeping the the Department of Defense up on the cutting edge of what's going on in the IT world, um, and and so they are uh, compared to us. You know, we're the we're the dinosaurs of innovation, and, and, and they're the, the the cutting edge of it. So so that's an, an example of of people that were trying to help us get outside the box of our own thinking, both in terms of of, of what we need to do to move the culture, but also in terms of thoughts about uh, what areas we might need to change. I'll just uh, add on to that as well. Yep. So that that's a, a, a idea that we've heard. You know, we've heard uh, need to look outward, uh, bring in diversity of views. Um, we had one idea. You know, send some of our staff to some of these companies that are have been successful in innovation to bring back ideas. So we're processing all that. Um, but to the extent that you have ideas on on how to integrate that diversity of thought, I mean, you could say hire new people. Okay. Or, or is there a way that you could think of where we can integrate that diversity of thought into our process within our current infrastructure? Um, any ideas you have along that would be very helpful. Back of the room, please. Hi, I'm Rick Grantham. I'm independent now, but I was uh, with South Texas Project for many years. I started my risk career in 1982. So I've seen the uh, 
the entire uh, breadth of risk-informed work and not work. Uh, we solved many of these risk-informed problems that you're currently dealing with because we've now gone and reinvented the wheel again. And it, many times in my experience, I've seen a, a well-thought-out, good technical risk-informed solution held up many, many years by lack of getting a finished review. And I would contend to you that that's really one of the areas in terms of the change management issue that you've heard before, and also in terms of how one manages through things like DPO processes, because it only takes one person to hold you up for seven years. And those are the frustrations that you feel, because we feel like we have good PRAs, mm -hmm. uh, we have processes to make certain they're continued well, and it doesn't look like that intelligence capital that we have worked on for, well, since 82 and longer, has been fully leveraged and utilized by the NRC internally doing, to increase efficiencies. So I'm curious, in a sense, in, along the change management, how are you going to look at the existing capabilities and processes uh, and innovations that we've done in the risk world to improve the agency and meet your uh, objectives? Okay. Thanks, Rick. Um, the third bullet on this slide I think touches a, a little bit on one of the areas that you touched on, and this is the timely resolutions to challenges. And, and it, it's not necessarily just associated with new technology. You, you know, you shared your frustration with uh, things getting tied up. You know, I think one of the commissioners this morning talked about paralysis, analysis, paralysis by analysis, but um, like also getting tied up with re resolving differing views on an issue. Uh, so one of the things that we've been talking to other organizations about is how do you break through things like that? Uh, keep Keeping consistent with our values of respect and cooperation, how do we break through those issues and, and, and get to resolution without dragging it on like that? So it's, if, if anybody, again, if anybody has experiences that, that have been successful there, we're always happy to hear them. Okay, front of the room and then back. Hi, Dan, Andrea. Terry Reese, Southern Nuclear. Hey, I'm looking at your themes and your tasking from Vic. It seems focused on, very much focused on licensing and change. But what about um, oversight? Mm -hmm. You know, we're now 19 years into the ROP. It served us well. But after 19 years, are we asking ourselves the question, is it still the right model for today's operating fleet? Yes. And uh, so, so I think that, that is a question I'll leverage to reinforce that, that we're talking, we're focused on the transformation side, but the innovation side is, is just as critical. Uh, and yes, there are people asking questions about the ROP and, and are there ways that we can adjust the ROP. I, I don't think, you know, when we developed the ROP, as you well know, you know, that was a clean sheet of paper look at the oversight process. I think that the questions people are asking right now are, are I would say, more incremental adjustments to the oversight process. Uh, some of them are bigger than others, but they are still essentially uh, changes to the oversight process. And so there are, those questions are being asked. It's just not something that we've, I think we've gotten a few ideas along those lines, but, but with our tasking being focused on new and novel technology, I think that's probably what's kept the numbers down in terms of ROP, but there is a certain amount of energy, I would say, throughout the staff on, on areas that we can do that better. Hi, uh, Bill Roscoe with Rolls-Royce. Um, and my comment deals with digital INC. Um, I heard a lot about benchmarking U.S. industries and aerospace and whatnot, and that's terrific. Have you considered benchmarking successful international utilities who've done digital upgrades um, and the relationship between the, uh, the vendors, the regulators, and the OEMs and how they've, how they've progressed? We seem to be, excuse me, stuck in the mud here in the U.S., and, and I have folks come in from internationally, and they're sort of amazed as to how we're caught in a quagmire here in the U.S., and yet you know, places like France are in their fourth generation of safety digital upgrades. So uh, it, you might be, want to consider something like that. Thanks, Bill. That's a, that's a great suggestion. We are meeting with some of our regulatory counterparts this week, but I take your point that, that uh, if, assuming we go forward with an initiative like in this area, that, that uh, benchmarking with international vendors and, and utilities would be a, a, another useful insight. Thanks.
follow up real quick? Uh, Dan, thanks for the comment that you made in my response. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit of additional information. We, we've even gone through the process of where we've had SERs, approved methods, uh, and then another utility, you know, tries to do the same thing, and now we're back to reinventing the wheel again where we have to go back and reapprove a method that has been reapproved, and, and that has caused a, a lot of frustration, and I would, I would invite you to do do one thing if you look at the categorization that was done in 5069 you know all of the components and functions that are really important and, and if you can pull that thread through the organization I think that you'll find that a lot of these efficiencies that you're talking about I, I lived this at South Texas and saw that kind of thing happen to the organization uh, so I would invite you to, to look at that kind of a of a tool there to give you the information that might help. Okay, th thanks, Rick. I, and and I think what I'm hearing is what I would say is is in the bin of the fourth sub bullet of the first bullet of leveraging existing reviews. And I don't think we we are as efficient or effective as we can be in that. But I, I take your your last word there as as uh, develop tools to to identify those prior reviews so that we can be more uh, consistent in identifying them to leverage them. Is that? I'll just add a little bit to that um, regarding the concept of using 5069 or some process to kind of categorize work. Um, it's interesting that uh, we had heard from several other government agencies that they have some system like that. So it is something we're thinking about. And again, if you have specific suggestions of what that might look like or examples that have been used in other organizations, that could help us think through that. That'd be very helpful. Okay, we've got the front and then the back. Uh, Jason Reamer, NEI. Uh, again, thanks for doing this. Uh, my question involves the energy and the uh, forcing function to keep this going and really do it. Most of the transformation that's happened in the industry is because uh, severe market pressure, collapse of prices. People had to figure out a different way to do it because it was their business. Uh, how are we gonna make sure that this thing really goes this time and we don't get caught into the Groundhog Day? Uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a worthy endeavor, but what's gonna give us the energy to make this happen this time? So, so uh, good, good, we're keeping the movie references going. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so, so thanks for that, Jason. I, and, and I think that, that falls under the part of our, our, uh, our initiative that's looking at what, what's going to ensure the success of the initiatives. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of literature on transformational efforts and, and the importance of identifying the burning platform. Uh, it, you know, and so for, for you guys, the burning platform is your, your market conditions. Um, I, I, I will say when we went out to the NRC staff to solicit for participants in this team. Uh, we were uh, inundated with the response. There is a lot of energy within the staff. Uh, I think there is frustration within the staff with some parts of our process and, and, a, and a passion to move forward. I can tell you there's a tremendous amount of passion on this team. Um, so I think that that's an important part of it. I think building the broad support for the initiatives, which is something we'll be working on over the next six to seven weeks uh, within the agency, working with the, the management teams, working with the staff to, to build alignment around uh, these are important things to do and we need to do them in, a, in, a, uh, in an expeditious manner, uh, all the way up to the support of the commission, which is ultimately the product that Vic has asked us to produce as a proposal to the commission and get their endorsement for it. Um, and, and so that, that I think will, will uh, help move us along the path. Uh, then I think the, that's the other piece of the tasking is what are the things we need to do to, to, uh, to sustain that momentum and, and not get mired in the details of working out the transformation initiative. And I think that's going to need uh, continued uh, leadership focus and continued just shining a light on this. It's going to have to continue to be a high priority for the agency, whatever uh, initiatives that we propose that the commission uh, endorses is going to need a continued uh, uh, high priority for the agency and, and leadership alignment to continue to move it forward. Um, 
So. Uh, there's a bullet there under culture. The second to last one says organizational focus. It's pretty amorphous, the words there. Um, but really what that means is we've heard from different organizations what has been successful in sustaining what we will start. And there's different models out there that have very lo varying levels of success. Uh, some organizations have set up a separate, separate organization just to focus on transformation. Some organizations may have a, one individual as a focus. Other organizations don't have that, and maybe it's just a, um, a leadership model. Um, so again, part of what we'd like to hear from you is what has been successful, because that is going to be a critical piece moving forward, and that's what that bullet meant. Okay, back of the room. Yeah, my name is Sean Clark with AMMI uh, Risk Solutions. Uh, transformation and innovation are, are a great thing in and of themselves. However, left to themselves, they can also create chaos. Mm -hmm. Okay, without a proper focus, without uh, a sense of what you're working on, the priority of those items, scheduling, deliverables, all those things, and how they affect the people who are here, especially the utilities. Can you, can you talk to how you're focusing your efforts so they don't just become an exercise in transformation and innovation, but in fact really are solving things that are plaguing this industry at this point? Yeah, thanks for that. It, it, yeah, we, we have, we have uh, not been spending a lot of time on that for the last six weeks because we're really in the storming phase of the project and, and really just looking to take in as much as we can. Uh, we have been, the, the, I mentioned there's over 500 ideas we've gotten from the staff, so the team has been, uh, the team early on established a set of criteria for evaluating these ideas and prioritizing them uh, on, on their transformational nature, the impact they would have, the, the benefit, the complexity, the, the, uh, um, whether, whether this is the right time in, in the process for, for a transformational. So there, so, so that's been kind of the prioritizing piece of it. I think over the next six to seven weeks, as we look to translate these ideas into themes and then into actionable initiatives, uh, we'll be looking at some of the exact things that you just talked about is, is uh, what, what's a reasonable time frame to accomplish this? What's, what's the benefit of accomplishing this? What's, what's, uh, uh, what, are, what are the uh, measures, you know, if we pursue this initiative, how are we gonna measure the success of this initiative? What, what is it, the impact gonna be to the NRC, what's the impact going to be to the to the licensee community from from this initiative? So those are the kind of things that we will be focusing on uh, as we develop these into actionable initiatives. Uh, Fernando Ferrante with Apri. Um, uh, speaking of Groundhog Day, I think we could probably mention more <laughs> risk informed initiatives in the past than movies that have essentially failed or haven't gone far enough. Just to mention one, the near-term task force recommendation one, which was the one that was driving really the ideas behind all the others, was one that never really went anywhere. And there was the Apostolakis, RMRF, risk prioritization initiative. So one thought, maybe a suggestion is, if risk informing is going to be expanded, as well as improving the, the current risk informing activities, then there has to be an overarching recommendation that is bold enough for the commission to actually get behind it. Because some of these initiatives to go forward because the commission itself was not comfortable with them. So I think, uh, you know, it's a good theme. We have explored it before. Um, I, I believe it probably will not succeed if we try to do it piecemeal to try to let each person or each group try to interpret what it means to them, especially if it's a cultural change. Um, I think there has to be something that is overarching about risk inform if you truly mean that that's going to change and the commission has to have it behind it. That, Fernando, thanks for that. Uh, let me throw a question back at you before you disappear on me. Thanks. So, so the commission has an overarching statement of policy on the use of PRA. We've had it for 22 years. Um, I've read it a couple of times over the last six weeks. A and uh, I would argue that perhaps are we, are we fully living into that policy statement? Do we need a new policy statement or do we need to live into the policy statement that we have? you have a thought on that? I think in my mind, um, and this was discussed um, in some uh, commission briefings early on last year, um, I don't know that a policy statement is necessary, I and mean, I think the policy statement is clear enough. The question is, you know, we've been living on the shadow of Reg Guide 1.174 for many years. So I think the question is, do we need something in between that 
that applies more broadly and is not just plan licensing basis changes that explains what does it mean to use risk principles? What does it mean defense in depth when you're talking about digital INC? What does it mean for areas that haven't seen those type of concepts? And so maybe it's something at a, at a high level enough because I don't believe asking each individual group to figure out is gonna make sense, but it's something that has to come from above and has to be filled with guidance and understanding what it means to different applications. So that will be kind of my answer back. Um, you know, telling people just go look at Red Guide 1.174, I don't, I don't know how that's gonna help anybody at this point in time. At the same time, existing processes on risk inform can be improved as well. And so if that document comes from a higher level, it might make more success than not. And again, we try to get there somewhere, so there has to be buy-in that something like that can happen and can be put at the right level. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Tom Weber, I'm a director of Rake Affairs at Palo Verde. <clears throat> I, I think the first four bullets uh, that you've got into the themes there, um, I support the incremental suggestions and uh, ideas on those. I think the last bullet, the culture, is the key one. At Palo Verde, we, we actually have a leadership model, and we rolled that out uh, when we transitioned out of column four. And I remember personally, how is a book going to make a difference? You know, a book of philosophies and strategies, how is that going to really make a difference? I, I couldn't, I personally couldn't see it. Yeah. But it wasn't until the leadership from the top down uh, advocated daily use of that model did it actually make a difference and so that we we I think at Palo Verde we've found some advantages and uh, improvements in the leadership model we continue to use that now and we've shared some of that those thoughts with uh, members of NRR NRC NRR during the course so yeah. thank you thank you Tom Okay, any uh, further thoughts, ideas, opinions, questions that folks have? We've had a nice slow trickle of people coming to the microphones, which has been great. <laughs> Please, back the room. Uh, this is Philip Simon from New Logic Solutions. Um, I'm, I come from a different industry, oil and gas, chemicals, so I, I look at it from in this discussion from that perspective. One, and I think several people here did bring up this topic, which I'm going to reinforce right now, which is that <clears throat> very often we look for solutions. I mean, this has been my experience. We look, we tend to be given solutions to pursue before we even figure out why we are doing this and what really it should be. So sometimes <clears throat> I think the transformation at the NRC level, I, I believe, is the intent is to help the nuclear industry become profitable and successful because they're able to function now. The question is, can they function more efficiently? If that's the reason, then I think it's probably a good idea to get a lot of grievances from the industry. I mean, this is what we would normally do in consulting, is to find out what's bothering you, what's holding you back, what are your hurdles that's, that we can take away so that you can be profitable. and Maybe looking at it from that perspective, and I think somebody brought that up here about why we're doing it. We can determine what is the um, priorities to give for the transformations on the on this side of the fence, so that they can be more successful. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying the same thing everyone's already thought about, or just uh, uh, another perspective on it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. I. I, I I think uh, there are aspects of this initiative where we hear messages that it's, it's not a question of the prof profitability of the nuclear industry, although I know for a lot of you that's a major concern. Um, but in some areas we hear we are a barrier to safety. For example, the digital INC. If we're an obstacle to the effective use of digital INC to, as, as, as Vic was showing, the reduction in, in initiating events through scrams, uh, if more, more widespread use of digital INC would reduce initiating events through scrams, 
uh, that could enhance safety. If it enhances reliability, if it enhances the operator interface, there are a number of potential safety enhancements out of digital INC, but that the lack of clarity and reliability in the regulatory process is, a, is an obstacle to licensees making that investment. That's not a place for a safety regulator to be. So, so I think at, at its most basic, we're looking at the current environment uh, you know, accident tolerant fuels is another one. Could could be a, a, a significant safety enhancement. Uh, we want to be able to regulate that in an appropriate manner, without being an obstacle to that safety improvement. So I think at the at the root of this, and and I think it's part of the focus on new and novel technologies, is there's potential for safety enhancements where the regulatory process becomes a barrier to achieving that enhancement. That is not a place for a safety regulator to be, and we want to identify those areas and not be in that place. So I think that's probably a, uh, where I would say that at the root of the task that this team has been given. Matthew Gordon, Office of Research. I appreciate the list that was presented. I think you're on the right track, but I would also add managing current data managing current data. This is a very significant problem within the, within the NRC. You know, as an example, we work with a number of offices and different branches, and a senior reviewer in one of those branches, is, branches, without cynicism and without exaggeration, is telling us we spend about three quarters of our time, our review time, finding and refining the information necessary to do the review. And that's a cultural problem where, if I may, and simply my perception is, I don't think the SES appraisal process adds a lot of incentive to say to their supervisor during appraisal, I made sure the branch chief under me managed and maintained a database of his predecessor. It's not innovative, it's not really change, it's just maintaining things. But it is a very significant issue because it drains time or resources from both the licensee and from the NRC. And this extends throughout our IT infrastructure. We use Google to find things in Atoms because Atoms doesn't work. Every, and every, I hear people starting to laugh and chuckle and nod their heads. We all know this. It's an open secret and it drains morale. So please. Managing data is a very crucial part of this transformation initiative. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Hi, uh, Pete Carlone from NPR Associates. Uh, what's the average age of the pers people on the Transform, the NRC organization team, and how are you leveraging the youth and creativity within the organization in a way that uh, those of us that have to carry on the industry into the future uh, who have to live this transformation will be able to do that. Yeah, thanks for that. I don't have the age demographics, but I can tell you that, that the team, you know, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks that, that we have a breadth of, of experience in the team. Uh, that breadth of experience ranges from, I think, in the neighborhood of 30 years at the NRC at the high end to, I think, about three years at the NRC at the low end. Um, and most, yeah, I think there's there's kind of a bell curve. So I think a, a lot of the a lot of the transformation team are in the range of 10 to 15 years at the NRC. So we are we are looking to uh, kind of a, a mix of, of level of experience, level of familiarity what, with what we do, as well as just uh, bringing fresh perspectives to to the to the effort. So so I think that that's a that's a great insight there and, and uh, I think it's important that, that uh, we let the people who are going to be living these processes for the next 20, 30 years be the ones who are helping to build them. Uh, hi Dan, hi Andrea, my name is Hodney, I'm with the Nuclear Energy Agency uh, and we're part of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and we're based in France. and. And in that job, you, you probably know this, I, I have a chance to work with the regulatory bodies from all around the world and research institutions from all around the world. And I was looking at your comment there about leveraging existing reviews. It's under the expansion of risk-informed licensing. But my observation is that I've seen in some countries a readiness and ability to accept 
regulatory reviews and information from other countries as input to their decision-making process. And I think it, it can work. <laughs> so I, I wonder, is this something that NRC might be thinking about with some of the areas that you've been stuck in, or we've been stuck in, I should say, you know, I'm, obviously I'm from the NRC, but working at the NEA now, but like in digital instrumentation and controls, uh, but perhaps even looking forward with advanced reactors, because, you know, other countries are moving ahead with looking at some advanced reactor designs, and as I mentioned, it seems to me that in some cases, uh, some regulatory organizations have been able to use NRC input uh, NRC uh, reviews as input into their regulatory decision making. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, thanks, Ho. I, I, I think that's a, a uh, I think that's a cultural shift for the NRC. So I, you know, I think it could be uh, transformational. Like going back to, to Rick's comments earlier about uh, you know, identifying our own reviews and, and leveraging them uh, is is would would be something new for us. Uh, it would certainly be new for us to, to uh, look to another country's review of a technology, but I think we should definitely look at the merits of that. I, you know, I think the hazards are the same wherever we are in the world, and, and so we ought to look at uh, opportunities to leverage the work that others are doing. I think uh, we'll probably, with the, with the breadth of, of uh, options on the menu for advanced reactor technologies, and I think other countries are getting out ahead of us in, in the process on those, we ought to be open to looking at the work that others are doing. Okay, um, Dan, I thought we had a slide that had some questions on it for the group. Yeah. We've, had, uh, we've had this one up. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we could uh, see if this gets a little bit of, of discussion going here. Um, any of these questions resonate with you? What do you view as the most important area for transformation of NRC's regulatory framework for new and novel technology? How would you propose we revise, refocus our regulatory framework to improve this area? What obstacles would need to be overcome, and what would be the benefits? Just wanted to kind of focus on this slide a little bit, uh, just to see if this kind of got some conversation going. Come on, here's your chance. Oh, I got a hand right here. Yeah, Richard. Who wants to get to her first? <laughs> All right, looks like Richard's got her. Ruth Ann's turning around looking confused. <laughs> looking for others. My name is Hiroko Kondo, a change management consultant from Tokyo. And um, I have a couple of questions. And what is your expected outcomes for, um, to realize the transformation? And second thing is that and I've heard that there is a kind of uh, barriers to realize the transformation. But I thought uh, there is a kind of a strength of NRC to realize the transformation. And what is the strength of an NRC? or to, you know, realize the transformation. Thanks for that. Uh, so expected outcomes, uh, I think I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, we, we are at least receiving messages that we are a barrier in some respects to the utilization of technologies that could enhance safety either at existing plants or, or in, in future designs. And so an expected outcome would be that that perception is resolved, that uh, we have a regulatory process that is consistent with our principles of good regulation to be independent, clear, open, reliable, and eff efficient, uh, and, and uh, results in, in uh, a process that uh, licensees and applicants have confidence that they can work through that process and, and uh, receive the ex expected outcome in the licensing of the technology. So I, th I think that's probably the, the most uh, substantial uh, core expected outcome of this activity. Um, I, th I think the second question I, I understood perhaps the stability is a strength of, of the, the agency. Reliability in a, in a regulatory culture tends toward a, a, a inertia that needs to be overcome to implement change. Uh, and historically we tend to, cons we, we pride ourselves in being a continuous learning and continuous improvement organization, but we make changes that are incremental uh, in improving our efficiency or improving our regulatory framework. 
So I think in, in this particular case, uh, we're asking ourselves in light of the feedback that we're getting, are there particular areas where we do need to start with a clean sheet of paper as we did with the reactor oversight process? Um, so I, I think that uh, the strength, uh, I, I guess I would like to see the strength of the agency being responding with appropriate change where change is needed uh, and we're incremental where incremental is needed and, and transformational where transformational is needed. And I think the challenge before this team is what are the areas where transformation is needed and needed at this time. And again, I want to remind folks that uh, coming to a microphone at today's session is not the only way that you can provide your input. Uh, if you'd rather provide them on the cards, um, we do have those and are kind of have some people collecting those as we go. Uh, you can also send an email to transformation.resource at nrc.gov. Looks like we have a couple hands up here in the front. Uh, Jack Robe, Exelon. Uh, Dan, I think I understood that the outcome of your uh, group is going to be some recommended areas to pursue transformation, um, assuming that the commission endorses that. What would be your expected uh, involvement for the industry in formulating the detailed structure for how that transformation will go forward? I think it's going to depend on the, the nature of what we recommend. So, so if, for example, we recommended that the agency pursue endorsement of a, a standard that sets requirements at a higher level for digital INC, obviously that is going to at some point get us into rulemaking and rulemaking it follows the Procedures Act and takes the time that it takes and the role of engagement will be for the industry to comment and participate in the, in the standards. I think one of the things that we're looking at, one of the things that we've learned about transformational efforts is they need to have uh, quick wins. Uh, so one of the things that we're chewing on is there a way to pilot that. Uh, so that might be an opportunity for industry to engage in, in, in a piloting a digital system under a different standard that, that the agency might be uh, evaluating endorsement of. Um, if, we, if we pursue you know, something under the first broad theme there of systematic expansion of risk-informed licensing, that may not require changing any rules. That might be more in, in our review guidance to our staff, but I think that there would be a, a, a need to engage the public in the development of that guidance and how we're changing our approach to licensing, and that's going to uh, impact uh, how licensees prepare license applications, I would think. So, uh, so I think there would be probably a, a less structured engagement than the rulemaking approach, but I think we would still want to be engaging with uh, our public stakeholders on how we are going to approach that. So I would expect that once the commission decides what uh, initiatives they're going to endorse, what the nature of the initiative will determine what the nature of engagement will be. But the one thing I'm confident of is there will be engagement. Hi, Tammy Bloomer, uh, USNRC. Um, I wanted to focus just a little bit more on culture and keeping the movie theme going back to the future. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times the, the white sheet for the ROP. What did we learn about our culture or what we need to do to change the culture in order to implement something like that? And how would that apply now or does it apply now? I think um, we are, as an agency, fairly risk adverse. And so to change a culture, to take something that's transformational and change it and to continue to uh, let it evolve over long periods of time is very difficult for us. So do you have anything that you've thought of that you have looked at to address the culture aspect? So, so thanks, Tammy. We're, we're obviously our tasking had a lot of cultural aspect to it and, and you can see the themes here under culture. Um, and and it, the good news for the NRC people is it's not us, it's just people, um, and we're people. Uh, there is a, there is a uh, level of comfort in, in the way we do things, uh, and there, you, there is an inertia there that we need to overcome, and that's overcome by uh, organizational focus. You see there, it, it's consistent messages in leadership, it's sustaining that focus over time. 
Uh, it's demonstrating the quick wins that I've talked about a little bit. Uh, at some point, uh, you you got to move forward with the change, and some people will come to the change reluctantly, uh, and and then they will see the change that you're trying to create, uh, and they'll come along and come on board. So some people will be on board right at the beginning. Uh, some people will come along at different stages, and we need to build that into the communications and the change management for any change initiative, but for, especially for a transformational initiative uh, to, to bring people along continuously throughout the process. Um, I, I think you know, one, of, one of my recollections of the ROP uh, was uh, being at a, 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 a seminar of regional inspectors about six months into the implementation of the ROP and inspectors getting up and talking about findings that they had processed through the system and other other inspectors who, who were skeptical of the new system and their ability to process issues through the system were saying, wow, okay, it, it is kind of working. So, um, you know, I think some people will be on board and, ha and share the vision. Some people will need to see the product uh, and you need to keep the, the, the focus and the burning platform, if you will, going uh, throughout the process to bring everybody along at the pace they're able to come along. So we spent uh, four or five weeks now gathering input in kind of, as Dan said, in the storming phase, and, and we are kind of moving beyond that now, have, have these themes, and we have been thinking about what has worked in the past and what hasn't worked in the past, and previous efforts the agency has taken on through Project AIM. You know, somebody already mentioned the work that the plethora of work that's been done on risk-informed initiatives in the agency and trying to study um, where those went, what worked, and what didn't work to try and gain some insights um, into the cultural shift and, and what will work best now. Tom Zechariah, NEI. Um, so the ROP was brought up a few times here, but it sounds like the suggestions that you were getting uh, you feel are incremental. Um, I think part of this effort is looking at not just uh, new technology for the exi existing fleet, but new reactors, Sm uh, think, uh, reactors that are smaller and more compact. Uh, do you see any need for transformation in the ROP for a reactor that's, you know, two megawatts uh, versus a thousand? Yes, uh, I think I think the question is when's the time for that? Um, you know, I think we're we're in the, the stage of, of learning what the technical issues will be for the, the licensing of those technologies. I think as as those advance, uh, we'll get to that point of, of needing to say, okay, does a reactor oversight process for the existing fleet of large light water boiling and pressurized water reactors fit to a you know two or a seven megawatt molten salt or high temperature gas cold reactor, obviously not. Uh, so we will need to re rethink that. Uh, you know, even, even for the large light water AP1000 uh, is going to have a little bit of differences in, in the oversight process and, and we have worked through that for the transition to operation for Vogel when it gets there uh, for, for totally different technologies, yeah, we're going to need to rethink the oversight process. I think that's going to come at a little bit later point in time. Yeah, Jack Grove, excellent. I, I'm glad Tammy brought the ROP transition up. Um, that, that was about a four-year process, two years to formulate the new ROP, and two years after implementation, it was routine. The motivation for that was a one-third cut in the NRC budget. Right. That's pretty motivational. <laughs> How do you anticipate generating that same level of energy to make these kinds of transformations? You've got incentives down here, but I'm just trying to envision the incentive for fundamental change and the risk behaviors of the agency when we've been doing it this way for so long. So that's something we've been chewing on a little bit. We, we had a really interesting talk with a guy who's, who's done four startups and he's on his fifth startup and, and he and he talked to us about how motivated people were because he has created 27 multimillionaires and we said yeah okay we're a government agency I don't think that's gonna work for us um, but we do have uh, incentive programs for the NRC staff so one of the things we're 
thinking about is, is are there different ways that we can approach our, with the resources that we have available to us, the, the way we approach our incentives relative to that? Because we, we talk about a little bit earlier about the leadership model and, and the creating, you know, Vic talked about the leadership model applying to every NRC employee as a leader. It's not positional leadership, it's, it's uh, effective leadership at every level. And, and that model, including uh, being more open to new ideas and less risk averse in, in embracing new ideas, uh, we'll have to think, we're, so one of the things we're thinking about here in the, in the theme area is, for culture is how, do, how does that apply to our incentive programs? But I, I think you know you 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 started that question with the the, the one third cut to the resources, which is more of an institutional level of motivation. I will say that the fact that we're doing this, the fact that Vic chartered on this us on this effort, the fact that you heard reference to this effort from all three commissioners this morning, uh, I think there is an institutional energy behind this at the highest levels, with without. It's a catalyst like that. We just need to deliver on it so we don't get the catalyst. That kind of catalyst. And, and we don't have the same incentive we had back when we developed the ROP. But it kind of goes back to what Dan was saying earlier that in just soliciting volunteers to work on this group, we were inundated. There is an institutional um, desire to move forward. Um, I don't know that I can speak for 100 percent of the NRC staff, but I work here. I work for a long time. And I think it's inspiring to think about what we could be in the future. We want to remain a relevant regulator. We don't be, want to be a regulator that stands in the face of, of a safety improvement. I think uh, 99 percent of the people who work in the agency, they want to do the right thing. And it, to me, that rings true. I think it rings true for a lot of the staff at the NRC. We haven't heard from the back for a while, so let's go there, and then we'll come back up to the front. Dave Lockbaum, Union of Concerned Scientists. You mentioned uh, quick wins a couple of times. Could you really have a quick win with digital INC or advanced reactor technology? If so, that's a pretty loose definition. <laughs> so, so it, the uh, yeah, it is a, it, it is a comparatively loose definition. But I think you know we're we're not going to do a transformational change to digital INC in three months after we're done with this project. But I think if if we can, you know, if we end up, say, with a path that's looking at uh, endorsement of an alternative standard approach to licensing digital INC, uh, if we can also, in parallel, be be working to pilot that approach as it, once it's sufficiently developed, uh, you know, it, yeah, it's not a, it's not a quick win like we issue our paper and the next Monday we're celebrating that, but I think it's it's incremental progress and it gives some confidence that the process is moving toward a, a, a uh, successful outcome. So, so I, yeah, it's a relative term. But I think one of the, one of the key things I've picked up in, in looking at transformational efforts is, is that, that uh, promising somebody six, something six years from now and, and that's all they're going to, you know, they get to wait for that is not something that, that uh, inspires confidence in the overall process, but if you can show progress toward that. Uh, so that's part of what we'll be thinking about as we, as we develop these proposals, is what are, what are some ways that you can get some demonstrated successes early in the process that give you confidence that it's going to move toward a successful conclusion. My name is Robert Shapiro. I'm with the Dwayne Morris Law Firm, and I've represented uh, various clients before all sorts of federal agencies, federal courts, uh, deadlines. Uh, nothing focuses an organization, it's the bottom bullet there, uh, organization or an individual like a deadline. And I can't think of any set of clients that I've had that have been more challenged than electric nuclear utilities in terms of dealing with their regulator, in terms of the unpredictability of when they're going to get a decision. And I would urge your group to consider uh, the agency imposing on itself deadlines of various sorts uh, that could actually, again, transform the agency, including up to the commission, uh, to get deadlines, uh, to get decisions out in some kind of reasonable time frame. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. And, and 
I, I would acknowledge that that's an area that the NRC has been trying to do better in, in our licensing processes as an example of, of, of meeting our uh, deadlines. We, we, I'd acknowledge we don't have the greatest history on meeting our own deadlines, so, so, um, so I think we need, we need to set them, but we also need to meet them. I, I just point. to simulate the discussion a little bit to get some of your thoughts. Um, that bullet there on timely resolution to challenges is, is kind of along those lines. Mm -hmm. And um, so the thought is, are, are there ways when you have a challenge in an organization with an issue that challenges our regulatory framework, how can you elevate that issue and allow us to move forward quickly uh, to meet deadlines? And so if you all have thoughts on uh, constructs along that line that have worked, that, that would be helpful feedback for us because we have been thinking about, about just that issue. Okay, let's go to the back of the room and then back to the front. Hi, Tony Zimmerman, Duke Energy. Uh, could you please elaborate on the second bulleted theme that you have there on additional flexibilities for licensees to make changes? Is, is that beyond the higher level digital standards you mentioned earlier to include potential changes to 5059? Yeah, so that, that one, uh, I think, comes out of a, a number of comments that we got internally related to staff spending time on licensing reviews that have limited value from a safety or security perspective. So I think broadly that would include uh, rethinking the framing of 5059 as well as, uh, say, 5054P for emergency plan changes, 50, or security plan changes, 5054Q for uh, uh, EP plan changes. So really it's, it's getting to, are the thresholds defined in our current change management mechanisms at the right level uh, to ensure that, that uh, both licensees and the NRC staff are focusing their time on truly safety significant issues? Hi, my name is Tanya Hood, and I work for the NRC. And I just wanted to go back to the comment that Andrea made earlier when the EDO called for staff to participate and join the transformation team. There was a lot of buzz in our agency for that. And it's not that there's a lot of members in the NRC that aren't um, thinking of moving forward with transformative actions. A lot of us come to work on a daily basis with an internal drive to do what's great. We work here at an industry and in an agency that watches over the safety and culture of the environment and the people. It's not just what's happening in the industry that's being monitored. My family is also monitored by the work that I do. The level of detail that I put in and the thoughts that I have to make us better, to think of how we can do our jobs better is also an assistance to myself and my family as well as those around me. So as an agency, a lot of our individuals here, because one of the first few things I was told when I joined the NRC is, you are a regulator, here to do great things for the public and for yourselves. So we have the initiative internally. It's not that we have to have a whole lot of external incentives to get us to do our job. We know our job is important, and we take pride in doing it well. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few more minutes left in the session. Uh, got a hand right there, Richard. Uh, this is Rick Grant again. I promise it'll be my last statement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going back to your, uh, what are the priorities and, uh, and then uh, what you can suggest to, to help, um, I, I do believe that the, that the use of the risk technology is the highest priority because it cross cuts every organization in the NRC. Everyone has risk for their perspective, and it can be used in, a, in an overall perspective. The, the question I would ask on the second bullet, though, there is what kind of tools is the NRC going to give the organizations? How are they going to know what's risk uh, important? What kind of training are they going to get? Um, those are the kinds of areas that I think need to have some focus. What kind of performance indicator are you going to put together that says, hey, we focused on the right things and we didn't focus on the other things? And those are real kinds of tools that are, from a utility perspective, uh, every time we did a risk-informed application, there was a full training aspect. There was a full, do they need a new risk tool, you know, some way to get information. So I just offer that to you to think about on the, the feedback. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Okay, time for one or two more comments. And again, I'll remind you, uh, this is definitely not the only way that you can provide your feedback. 
We have the transformation.resource at nrc.gov email address. Uh, or you have a little bit more time to fill out your comment cards to be collected for this session. Anybody who's been sitting there just biding your time, waiting with a comment that you just had to get out before we ended, now's, now's the time. We do. All right, we got one. Look at that. Bob Rochelle with Duke Energy. So all of the transformations I've been involved in live or die on the first line management. The first line management supports it, it'll go forward. If they don't, it'll die. So what are you doing about getting the first line management fully aligned with this process? So um, I appreciate that. I think uh, that's probably something we need to focus more on. We have been at, through this stage of the process going out to all employees meetings throughout the agency, getting input throughout the agency. I think as we go back over the next six or seven weeks, we're looking for organizational alignment to support the initiatives that we put up to the commission. So I think we'll, I'll take that as a reflection that we need to make sure that we, we're bringing along the first line management as well on, on that process. But appreciate that insight. And we do have a few ideas um, along the lines of how organizations can hold themselves accountable to change and different ways that different organizations have instituted accountability in the organization for making a change. Um, so again, any thoughts you have on the best way to do that and what has worked it would be helpful. All right, last uh, chance at the microphone before I turn things over to Dan to close to our session. Okay, Dan, please. Well, thank you, Lance, and thank you, everybody, for sharing your, your thoughts with us as, as, as well as your questions. Um, I think that uh, from here over the next uh, six weeks or so, uh, this team will be taking these themes, crafting them, as, as we've said, into uh, what we see as the important initiatives to put forward before the commission. Uh, it doesn't mean that it, all of the energy that went into 500 plus issues from the NRC staff is gonna be lost once we narrow it down to a couple of initiatives. There was some talk this morning about the innovation forums. I talked a little bit about it here. Uh, we will be using those forums uh, to take the information that doesn't roll up into an initiative so we don't lose the energy and the good ideas. Uh, so, I mean, there were some even that I heard today from NRC staff about things we can do with our own information management systems to improve, and so we'll share those with our uh, chief information office as, as well. So, I mean, there's things outside of the regulatory framework that we can do to be more efficient. There's a lot of things in the innovation forums where we have uh, our own staff can say, gee, uh, this, this system isn't working as well as it should, or this bugs me, or there's ways to... to uh, get those into the system and bring about change. So I think you'll continue to hear more about transformation and innovation at the NRC in the years to come. Uh, as far as this particular project, we, as I said at the outset, we'll have a paper in May uh, that will put this team's recommendations uh, with the support of the senior leadership and hopefully the first line managers uh, to uh, recommend to the commission particular things that the agency should pursue in the very near term. So I appreciate your attention to this session, to this uh, issue, uh, and your feedback and questions. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon. The next session begins at 3.30.